There seems to be an odd sort of coincidence that this session is sandwiched between two Bollywood stars. Kalki, who gave this riveting performance just now, and to be followed by Salman Khan, who I'm sure all of, all, all of you all are dying to hear, if not see, particularly his body. <laughs> well, folks, buckle up and stay seated. For space, the subject we will focus on in this session is populated with stars of a vastly different kind. And there are, billion, and, and there are billion, billions of them. And unlike these stars down on Earth, they will shine for a long, long time and continue to fascinate us, enthrall us, and intrigue us. I thank uh, Arun Puri, my ex-boss, for invite me, in, inviting me to moderate the session. I recall that Arun took a bet with me of whether the Indian Space Department would, uh, would actually go up and put a, uh, put a probe into the moon, uh, in, in, into the moon, or to the moon, sorry. Uh, and I'm happy to say he lost. <laughs> I won a bottle of, bottle of champagne for that, and he gracefully presented that to me when, at my farewell party about four years ago. Uh, Arun, I hope that loss had nothing to do with the title of this subject, Rocket, Rockets versus Rotis. What do we do first, feed the hungry or reach the moon? As a subject, I think it is as provocative as the guns versus butter dilemma, and relevant too. And as we speak, another Indian spacecraft is, it's in, lo is in its long journey to Mars. Arun, I was thinking maybe we can take another bet on this. <laughs> At the outcome of these sessions with all those uh, cell phones that you cir circulate, uh, as I have two champions to debate and ideate on this question. And I hope after that we can have champagne again. I think that's what you do at the gala dinner. <laughs> but firstly, let me introduce our speakers. Our first guest is Dr. K. Radhakrishnan. He's chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization. He has an extraordinary biodata. Apart from piloting the Mars mission, he is an avionics engineer with a management degree from IIM Bangalore. He is curiously also an accomplished Carnatic vocalist and a Kathakali artist. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Radhakrishnan, Chairman of Indian Space Research Organization. Our second guest is no less uh, accomplished. Dr. Jean-Yves Lagall was still recently Chairman and CEO of Ariane Space, the European space giant that is today the world's leading launch service provider. Now he is president of, France, of France's space agency, the National Center for Space Studies, which formulates policies, does cutting-edge space research, and decides the country's space budget. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lagall. We have a short film that will play. I had the privilege of watching the January space launch live, 
and I was a little boy, a little boy all over again. Uh, if you ever see one, it's the greatest sound and light show that you can uh, watch or witness. Uh, the sound that, apart from the giant flame that's almost a kilometer long, the sound that you hear, the only thing I can compare it is if you put uh, 30 jet engines on at the same time, that is the sound. The roar is, is better than any rock band that you can <laughs> listen to. And so uh, while, while we're all fascinated with uh, space exploration, this session comes to a very hard question. Uh, and I'm going to invite Dr. Radhakrishnan to answer this, which is essentially with so many people still going hungry to bed in India, should we have an expensive space program that is sending rockets to the moon and Mars? Dr. Radhakrishnan. Mr. Arun Puri, Mr. Raj Changapa, Dr. Legal, distinguished panelists, distinguished participants. The question is a good one, rockets versus rotis. What to do first, feed the hungry or reach the moon? Before that, let me just say that I am proudly privileged to be here today. And the very fact that you have called me and my colleague, Dr. Legal here, for the first time, the space people being presented for this conclave indicates the impact that the space has made in this country to the people of the country. Apart from enriching the scientific knowledge, establishing the technical prowess, we have been able to do a lot for the people in this country, whether it is the strategic area, whether it is providing infrastructure for societal services that touch the life of the people, the fishermen, the farmer, the decision maker at the central government level or at the grassroots level. That's an indication. Apart from doing exciting things like mission to moon or mission to Mars. Space is the last frontier of humankind. And in India, we started this program in the 1960s, just four years after the modern space age began. But the uniqueness was there was a national vision at that time that future belongs to those who make friends with science. And it's science alone that can find solutions to hunger and poverty in the country. This is told by our Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. And Dr. Vikram Sarabhai's vision for the space in India was people-centric, application-centric, and that's the unique part of it. About the question, from the 1960s, the question has been asked why a country like India should get into space at all. When Aryabhata was launched in 1975, the same question was asked. When we started the inside system in the early 80s, this question was asked. In the late 80s, we were grappling with the problem of ASLV, two consecutive failures we had. The country asked, if you want to get into space, get some transponders on lease, or you can launch it from outside, why get into this problem? Again, when we had the Chandrayaan, people asked this question, why are you spending 300 crores in this country for a mission to moon? And recently, when for this Mars Orbiter mission, we started working and government gave us 450 crores of Indian rupees. The same question was asked. Now this question will continue to be asked. That's important. And there is also a question asked, can a country like India afford not to get into space? I'm trying to get some answers for this question. And also there is a feeling, sometimes when we are in good shape, people think, why are we not doing spacewalk? Why are we not putting our people into the space station? So this is also another perspective. But in ISRO, we ask this question every day. When we take a decision on any space program, these questions are asked and our touchstone is whether in the near future or in the far future, are these going to help the people in this country? Are these going to help the go governance of this country? And that is the first thing which I want to say. ISRO is not just flying rockets alone to moon or Mars. And in this case, there is no contradiction 
we do space activity in this country to help people to get the roti. The human facet of the Indian sp space program is exactly that. We have today 24 satellites in the orbit helping us to have a communication infrastructure, nearly 200 transponders. And we ask the fishermen in this country, how is it helping them? He will tell you, if I go to the sea, in my vessel, in a year, I save something like 5 to 10 lakhs of rupees, just because I don't need to waste my petrol or kerosene or diesel for searching for the fish. If you look at a person who is trying to find the location for a well, then he will say, I'm now getting a more precise information, and if I dig a well, I don't lose. Each well, you spend almost a lakh of rupees. And the whole country, this information is available. If you ask a farmer how he has to utilize his piece of land, then you get the quality of that land through the maps that are produced through the remote sensing data today. That is where it meets. It is making a difference. That's where it is helping the country towards food security. If you look at the water resources, the command areas, the irrigation potential, all these areas, space is there. Now you look at the disaster. We all knew about the file in cyclone. The INSAT satellites provided 400 imageries over four days to help the India Meteorology Department to find out the track of the cyclone, to give the prediction. And this year, we heard about only six or seven people dying. You look at the 70s when there was a cyclone in Divi, nearly 10,000 plus people died. That means the satellites are helping to save human life in this country. And this is the human facet of the Indian space program. And if we need to put these satellites in the orbit, then two things are required. That means we need to have the capability in the country for this technology. You must have the rockets to put these satellites into orbit when you require them to do it. And just having this capability alone is not sufficient. There's a large system in the country of user departments, the central government, state government, non-government organization. So you must get into their value chain and they must make use of it. It has happened in this country. That's very important. And then, some time ago, we also talked about the technological capability. What is the technological capability that we have achieved? Just mentioned about the GSLV and the cryogenics. It's a great achievement landmark in the country. We had a navigation satellite system recently launched in July 2013. We have a satellite for microwave remote sensing. When there is a cloud, you can penetrate and see that what is happening to the agricultural crops in the country. You can predict well before the harvest, what is going to be the production line? So government can take informed decision in the country. We have several PSLVs, 25 of them successfully launching, not only Indian satellites, satellites of other countries, nearly 35 we have launched. And we also launched a satellite for the French government, and one more is going to happen soon through our PSLV. And we are also looking at the future, and there is an agenda which certainly will unfold in a few minutes from now. When the country felt it was ripe for getting into the moon mission, we started that, and we were successful in our first attempt. And recently we embarked on Mars mission, and I'm very happy to say it is on course, it is in good health, and it is now at a distance of 21.5 million kilometers from Earth. And a signal sent from here to the satellite would take at least 72 minutes to reach there. So that's the kind of technology that we have got at the moment. And then if you look at what is happening around, we should say India has a place of pride in the global committee in space, one among the six. We have been there for a long time consistently, and that is another important part of it. I just want to conclude by saying it is imperative to tackle hunger in this country. And ISRO and the Indian Space Program has been playing a major role, and we would continue to play a major role in this direction. 
but there is also an intellectual hunger that the young generation of this country has and nearly 50% of this country belong to that community and we have a responsibility to provide that and that is one of their agenda item and there is a balanced agenda we are looking at the space application we are looking at the satellite technology we are looking at the advanced technology we are also looking at the exciting science that will tell you several things about the universe and about the existence of life on earth but they will later give new technology and enable new applications thank you very much thank you dr radhakrishnan you do make a convincing case but i am not going to hand the podium to dr ligal and if you could look at should a poor country like india have such an expensive space program apart from the fact that you have vast experience running the largest space agency dr ligal so good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen dear friends and uh, first of all i want uh, to tell you that i am very thankful to the organizers and uh, to my friend dr uh, uh, radhakrishnan who asked me to speak to you today i value this forum and this forum is well known in france because it's very very important and uh, when i got an invitation I was not surprised I was surprised to be invited but I was not surprised that this very uh, important forum uh, wants to deal with space because uh, as I do repeat uh, in France uh, we know uh, quite well uh, the India today conclave and uh, this year I am delighted to see that space has been considered for the first time for a special session but in fact I am not uh, so surprised since i closely follow the space activities of our fellow partner at isro and uh, needless to say recent months have been breathtaking space cooperation between uh, isro and its french mirror organization cnes is unique in space history in fact it dates back to the very beginning of both our space programs in the 60s and it has been sustained without interruption for the last 50 years and because also space has long been believed primarily as a science and technology catalyzer this century has seen it occupy an unprecedented place in our economies and i am sure that space activities will be a major pillar of the global economy before 2020 <coughs> the revolutions in communications and transportation that have made the world a smaller place were not enabled by the internet as usually reported but also by satellites to tackle global issues we needed a global view and global tools this is exactly what space is about on the other hand satellites are also the solution for local issues repeated plot to plot monitoring be it for crops soil moisture atmospheric pollution rates or ocean salinity among many others can only be acquired from space the growing scarcity of resources has resulted in a boom of satellite applications and using space data is the most effective way to maximize our efficiency while the upfront investment for space applications might appear high space is by far the cheapest way to address these vital objectives and it has a tremendous impact on our economies india as you know was one of the earliest to grasp this issue and following the brilliant vision of dr vikram sarabhai it concentrated from the outset on space applications there is no doubt the space assets have played a major role in making india a prime mover of the world's economy and i am sure that my friend dr radhakrishnan agrees with me in fact space is an unrivaled strategic tool for a nation's development the indian and french government have got the tremendous importance of space technologies standing since 1998 as one of the three pillars of the indo french strategic dialogue alongside the defense and civil nuclear activities the latest bilateral implementation agreement on space cooperation we signed it last year during president hollande's official visit to india 
Our embassy here in Delhi is extremely active in keeping space at the level it deserves, along with, that, with what is now called our economic diplomacy. So are we at agencies level. Indeed, as I mentioned before, our space organizations grew up together. The first Indian-French cooperation agreement in space was signed in 1964, and Dr. Radhakrishnan and myself, we already have convinced our respective governments to further build on our success. The intensive discussions underway between Indian and French specialists show that new areas of cooperation can be reasonably indigenous. ISRO has taken a big leap in entering new fields of expertise, and today we think that all avenues are open to discuss how we can once again join our efforts to co-develop new technologies. In conclusion, I want to tell you that I am highly confident in the future of the Indian-French partnership in space. The main reason for my confidence is that we can rely on the greatest asset we have, which is the human factor. In fact, generations of engineers have grown up together, and long may that continue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Legal. I think we've got time for some questions, but I'll ask uh, the first one. Dr. Radhakrishnan, if you look at the space budget, that's about 7,000 crores. And if you divide that by the population of this country, you could give 58 crores to each person in this country. So why not give him that, the roti, kapda, makan, and even a car with that, that kind of money? Why have a space program? Two inputs I would give. Number one, what space has given back to the country as direct economic benefits, as intangible benefits? If you look at this and look at some of those numbers that I was trying to tell you, based on the information that the satellites are providing to the individuals and for the governance process, based on the satellite transponders that are provided through the system, which otherwise we would have probably taken on lease at a huge cost. What is shown is the benefits surpass the expense that we put on that. Number two, if you look at the numbers, the amount of money that we spend on space in this country is just 0.34% of our central government expenditure. If you compare that with other countries' expenditure, for example, with the France, it's nearly 40% of what they spend. It's about 70% of what Japan spends. It is just 4.5% of what U.S. spends for their civil space activity. If you look in terms of GDP, we are just 0.04 percentage of the GDP on space expenditure. U.S. spends about 0.11 percentage. But India is a country which everyone is talking as a model where the applications have trickled down to the people, like fishermen, farmer, and the loss of life are avoided in this process. In terms of per capita, people ask, why are you spending 450 crores for the Mars program? What is 450 crores in this country? Just four rupees per individual. If you can just leave four rupees, you have a mission. But what it has done to the country, the younger generation today are excited to take up space as a profession, or science as a profession which is required for the future. How do you make that happen otherwise? So, in my view, this amount that we spend for such exciting missions is a small percentage. What we spend for the communication, remote sensing, navigation is really providing you direct economic and other intangible benefits to this country. I'd like to ask Dr. Lagarde, if you look at the Indian space program, you all are the big boys in space. How would India's space program compare? Why don't we just buy satellites from you all rather than putting up the entire infrastructure? You'll make satellites much cheaper than we do. And if we, if we require 10 or 15, we buy them off you rather than put this giant infrastructure. Why should we do what we're doing? 
No, I think that, uh, as it has been uh, said by uh, Dr. Radhar Kishnan, uh, space is uh, very, very uh, important for uh, all uh, mankind. And uh, we have uh, big space powers, not mo more than uh, six, because space is very, very difficult. And India is one of these uh, space powers. Uh, Europe and France are another one. And we develop, uh, all of us on our side, applications, science and so on, but uh, there is a point that we have in common, even if the way to, of developing the satellites and this rocket is different, there is a point which is in common, is that our economies cannot live today without space, without satellites. Just to show the importance of what we are doing, one day someone got the idea to say, let us imagine one day without satellite. And in fact, it's impossible, because everything would stop. No telecommunications, no meteorology, no uh, knowledge of uh, the universe. It seems obvious that uh, in the books of our children, you have beautiful images of Jupiter, uh, Uranus, uh, Neptune, and so on. But if we didn't send uh, scientific probes to this planet, nobody would know uh, as it is. And uh, we, a lot of people forget this uh, importance of space in the daily life. I used to give an example. In a very, very big country, a very high-level politician was asked to decide to spend $8 billion to replace the fleet of satellites for meteorology. And the answer was, but why do you want that we spend $8 billion? Because we have the weather report every night on the TV. <laughs> but why do we have the weather report on the TV? Because we have satellites. But it's so obvious that even the highest-level politician forget it. But in some senses, you have lost the telecom battle because today all of us use our cell phones that's on fiber optics, and fiber optics has overtaken whatever you all can do in space. Is that because your track record, uh, both in terms of the faulty, fault, faulty launches as well as the costs, has completely outpaced whatever else is happening on the ground? Each one of this uh, medium has its own niche if you talk about fiber optics or the satellites or the other medium that's coming up. And satellites are essential. If you look at the communication infrastructure today, inaccessible areas are only service using satellites. The flexibility that it provides. And for a country like India, if you want to get into the northeastern region or Andaman, Nicobar, Lecture Deep, that's the only way to get through. If you look at broadcasting and you see the scenario in the 80s, we had four metros which were connected with a bit of black and white TV. But today, you see what's the kind of facility that everyone is enjoying today. If you look at even the services that you get through ATM or any other activity, disaster management, weather forecasting is an area where space is playing a very major role today. You get good forecasts. You don't know where it is coming from. It is the effort of satellites and ground-based information and the atmospheric information put through a model and that comes to you actually, as reliable information. So there is a niche for that set of satellites coming from the 36,000 kilometer altitude. You didn't really answer that question. Is the Indian space program on top? Is it somewhere that compares with the rest of the world or are we just sort of patting ourselves on the back? Could you repeat? Is the Indian space program up to the mark in terms of the big no, boys like the Indian Space Program is completely at the top because we are very impressed by the missions which uh, have been decided, in particular under the leadership of uh, Dr. Radakishman, the mission to Mars, which uh, will... Uh, <laughs> That, that, that you, no, no, it's not the Martians. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the, the, the mission to Mars that uh, you launched uh, last uh, November and uh, which uh, will reach Mars in September is an example and is very, very impressive. Uh, the PSLV, the GSLV that you launched successfully a few weeks ago are really state of the art and uh, you have uh, many, many uh, developments. But I would like to come back on the question on the fiber optic. You see, in many countries, uh, you have fiber fiber optics in the cities, but we have what we used to call white zones, where you have people living without internet. And the only way to provide them internet at an affordable cost is with satellite in Kayaband, and this is exactly what we are doing. Even in France, which is a small country compared to India, but we have many places in France where we don't have a fiber optic, and the satellite is the only way to get people connected. I think we have time for one question, and I see a hand up there, and two. Can we take two questions? Is that okay? Uh, the 
question is for Dr. Al. Uh, the proudest moment perhaps as a journalist and uh, as an Indian was when I watched Chandrayaan take off from Sahar. Uh, and ever since that day, I have always wondered why does it have to be a journalist or a VIP who gets access into Sahar? You're talking about the younger generation wanting to go off uh, towards the direction of space research. Why can't a common Indian, perhaps like the Kennedy Space Center, drive up to Sahar, park his car and watch a rocket lift off because there is nothing more uh, encouraging or inspiring than actually seeing an Indian rocket take off from Sahar. Why don't we open it up to the common citizen? Yes, sir. It's a wonderful idea. In fact, we are moving towards that. First and foremost, what we have been doing is putting the whole thing on the Indian television channel, number one. Number two, it is available today through Facebook because there is a large number of our new generation who are going through that process. And I also should say, digressing from that, on the Mars Orbiter mission when we started, we want the people to live with us. And there is a Facebook which we started in October. And we have almost 3 lakh likes on that. People discuss space on that Facebook. This is what's happening. But your suggestion of getting the younger generation to Sri Kota is only constrained by the logistics because it's almost two hours from Chennai and we have to take them. But I will take your suggestion and we will say how we can implement so it. Just, it's not a question, just a suggestion. Uh, that's uh, right, sir. The suggestion, I, just wanted, I will try to. You know, I, I, I was talking about 30 question. jet engines. I'll say it's the voice of God, really, that <laughs> rocket launching off perhaps can't be matched on a Facebook update. That's all. Thank you, sir. One more question. Yes. And that's the final question. I got this. Oops. <laughs> Does that mean the end? My, my question is to Dr. Radhakrishnan. I'm Shubhrakant from my books. Uh, you talked about file, uh, the cyclone filing and lives being saved. Uh, I was there at, the, at that point of time and uh, I could see where, like uh, uh, great job by ISRO, but uh, the major credit to the saving of the life would go to the local administration and the government working out there. Uh, in my opinion, the credit that I, I think I would give to uh, the technology part of what ISRO does would be around 10% and 90% to the, uh, the local. What, do, what, do, what comment do you have, have on this? I didn't take the full credit for it. I only said we provided the imagery to India Meteorology Department who gave the forecast. That's all. Anyway, I think uh, we have to close this session. Uh, I'm sorry about this, but uh, is there a poll going on? at all, <laughs> rockets and rotis, I think that's what we want. And of course we want moon, the, uh, a mission to the moon, Mars and everything else. Is that right? Hands up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.